attention the reasons why in the budget contribution I brought to the attention of the national community the energy crisis in which we now find ourselves. It was done primarily to alert the population that there is a crisis which is being ignored by the government and it is a development to which solutions must be readily found both in the short and long term, if it is not to get worse. The Minister of Energy did not really deal with the crises which are, one, the current shortage of gas, and two, the dramatic drop in the reserves, as well as the competition Trinidad and Tobago now faces in its export of gas-intensive products, and in particular LNG. As I indicated in the budget, our, response, our reserves are now at the level of 13.5 trillion cubic feet, which is almost half of what it was when we began the development of the gas intensive industries. The point must be made that 1.5 trillion cubic feet of gas will have to be found every year for the NGC to find itself in a position to extend those long-term contracts to the point leases industries. And if Atlantic LNG is to maintain its current level of production. The Minister of Energy and Energy Affairs did not deal with these questions, but instead paraded in front of the parliament all the wonderful new investment promises that are currently being made, or shortly to be made. While these are welcome, the immediate issue is, where will the additional gas needed over the next five years come from? And most importantly, at what price? Secondly, even for the future gas discoveries, and we hope we do have gas discoveries, Will the pricing of such gas from the offshore deep sea license be made available at competitive rates to support the existing industries? These are the issues that a Minister of Energy should be addressing as we go forward in budgetary matters and seeking to secure our economic future. Until these solutions are found, we will remain in a state of uncertainty or worsening crisis. The minister, in a very sarcastic way, made reference to the fact that he will love a definition of energy expert because, and I quote him talking about himself, I am not an energy expert. Well, he didn't have to confirm that. We already know that because he was in fact a low-level functionary at British Gas, who is now Energy Minister. So that admission does not help us understand our problem. Let me elaborate on why individuals who either are not familiar with the world of energy, or who do not depend on the advice of experts within the ministry and elsewhere, can lead the country astray. In the minister's response, he says, and I quote, the central issue is not a lack of oil. 
Trinidad is awash with oil. I wish to point out, Trinidad and Tobago is a net importer of oil in order to keep the refining in production. Let me repeat that for those who would have heard the minister talking about us being awash in oil. Trinidad and Tobago is a net importer of oil in order to keep our refinery at point of air in production. Our daily production is now just about 80,000 barrels per day, and this is down significantly from 140,000 barrels or thereabout not too long ago. Trinidad and Tobago's reserves as of 2012 is in the order of 0.06% of total world reserves. And as you know, 0.06% is less than 0.1%. Compare this with our neighbor, Venezuela, who recently topped Saudi Arabia as having the most reserves in the world. 400 times the reserves of Trinidad and Tobago, accounting for 24% of total world reserves. Clearly, our minister has got the countries mixed up. Mixed up. Even in our natural gas, of which we are very proud and heavily dependent, our reserves are less than 1% of total world reserves, standing at just over 13 trillion cubic feet. The reserves of Venezuela are now said to be in the order of 200 trillion cubic feet. It's against this background that we in the PNM have to raise the issue and will continue to raise the issue relating to the agreement reached with Venezuela over the future of Loran Manatee Field, even though certain columnists in the newspapers describe us as fabricating an, uh, an issue. For us, it is not a minor matter, and if it is viewed as fabrication, then we're happy to fabricate it so that the public could understand where we at, where we're going, and where we could have gone. We are told that the voting rights for any major decision relating to the development of this gas field assigned to Trinidad and Tobago is 16%. In simple terms, we own just under 30% of that field, I think it's exactly 27%, and our voting rights are 16%, making us a truly ineffective minority partner against an agreement where final decisions require 75% of voting rights. And I want to repeat that so you can understand it. Final decisions are agreed to be made by 75% of the voting rights. We have 16%. So others who have 84% will determine final decisions. And we are being told by the minister in his tour of Trinidad, not the tour of Venezuela, tour of Trinidad, not the press conference in Venezuela, tour of Trinidad, that there's a veto available to us to veto. So apparently I was trying to lie in vetoing what the 84% voting rights do. I don't know how that will get the fields and the production going forward. But there's a decision in the, in the agreement that 84% of the voting rights lie elsewhere. We have 16%. I do only require 75% of those voting rights to make final decisions. I would like the minister to disagree with that in Trinidad and Tobago as that is our information and we have seen the document which says that. The gas assigned to Venezuela the, um, in Loran Manity of the 10.3 trillion cubic feet, Venezuela has just over 7 trillion cubic feet. We have the rest. And for Venezuela, that 7 trillion cubic feet, you see it in the context of reserves of 200 trillion cubic feet and all that Venezuela wants to do in Venezuela for Venezuela. They have available to them in the order of 200 trillion cubic feet, of which only seven is in Manatee. However, for Trinidad and Tobago, where we're now living on our existing industries, our three trillion cubic feet, if we get that up and going, represents a 25% increase in our reserves. So clearly, our interest and nervousness about our 3% and monetizing it has to be far superior to Venezuela's drive for 7 
million cubic feet out of 200 million. So 7 trillion cubic feet as against 200 trillion. As you would know, from the time this gas border, this cross border fields were discovered, there was an intention in Trinidad and Tobago that that gas would eventually come to us somehow. Our, our gas at least, our own at least, and possibly some of Venezuela's come to our plants in, in, in Trinidad. High level initiatives on the part of Trinidad and Tobago saw in 2006, Memorandum of Understanding being signed between our Prime Minister Patrick Manning and the then President of Venezuela. It was always our intention and I dare say some expectation throughout the negotiations over the years to have an agreement which would see gas from this field. And in fact, there are three fields there. There's Loran Manatee with 10.3 trillion. There's Coquina with 0.7 trillion. And there's Dorado with 0.3. So the two smaller fields together represent one trillion. And Loran Manatee is the main field with 10.3. And it was always the intention that um, we will expect that that gas can come to us, our own, and maybe some Venezuela. The published international reports and the confusing positions described by government spokespersons do not give a clear picture as to what is to be expected for Trinidad utilization of Loran Manatee production. On the contrary, there are numerous reports attributed to the Venezuelan Minister of Energy of agreement which point to clearing of the way for pipeline and industrial use in Venezuela within a time frame of two years. While there appears to be, from all these reports coming out of Venezuela, about Venezuela, there appears to be a clear picture of Venezuelan use of Loran Manatee gas with reference by the, by the Venezuelan minister of other fields of cross-border gas for Trinidad. There is no reference or clear commitment to when and if a pipeline is in the works to bring any gas to Trinidad. That is the situation that we are concerned about. All the reports in the reputable international publications point to discussions and agreement to sell Loran Manatee gas to Venezuela, although it would have been cheaper and eagerly anticipated in Trinidad. I draw your attention to a British press article known at interfax.co.uk which mirrors similar articles in Reuters, API and others where reports of a press conference in Venezuela describe what prospects are to be expected arising out of the meetings between Trinidad and Tobago and Venezuela at the ministerial level. All these reports quote the Venezuelan minister talking about what the agreement will trigger and will do for Venezuelan industry and the utilization in Venezuela. The only reference to the Trinidad and Tobago minister and what he had to say about this, where we are desperately in need of gas to bolster our reserve and to keep our industries in Trinidad. The only reference to our minister is him saying that he could see Venezuela from his office. Absolutely no statement of commitment about any gas coming to Trinidad, any pipeline to Trinidad, any agreement of us having any access to Venezuelan gas, or better still, having access in the immediate or short term of our three trillion cubic feet to um, from Loran Manatee. And bear in mind that Loran Manatee on both sides of the border is Chevron, the oil company that has the rights to explore, with a bigger chunk on the Venezuelan side and a smaller piece on the Trinidad and Tobago side. And they have voting rights accordingly to those two shares. However, because of the reports of the expeditious nature with which Venezuela is now going to proceed, to do its gas, one has to expect that Chevron 
would be busy carrying that out in Venezuela for the Venezuelan initiative. We see and hear no comment from Chevron, from our government, from anybody about what is to happen to and about Trinidad and Tobago's interests and needs in this matter, especially against the background of our need to have gas to keep our competitive nature and in fact I dare say to keep some of the plants that we don't have in Trinidad and Tobago because some of those plants, their contracts for gas supply are ending now and discussions about gas supply and gas prices would influence whether those plants continue in Trinidad and Tobago, the terms on which they continue and worse, if anybody could see the condition in such a way as to be causing them to think that they would want their plants elsewhere. These are the concerns that our Minister of Energy should be treating with and looking after our interests about. Instead of that, we're getting all kinds of talk without addressing the issues. And these are fundamental issues of lifeblood for Trinidad and Tobago. I will say no more about this for the moment because this has serious implications for the plans and programs that we had for developing the Southwest Peninsula and for maintaining the industries that we have elsewhere in Trinidad, which are gas dependent. The minister in his statement attempted to gloss over the continuing lack of investment in the downstream industries in Trinidad and Tobago. He made reference to Methanex and PCS. My question to him, and the question that the population should ask is, why did Methanex, so well established in Trinidad and Tobago at Point Lisas, move their plants from Chile, not to Trinidad and Tobago, but to the United States? The answer to that question would be very instructive to the people of Trinidad and Tobago. Another question that should be posed to the minister, PCS is expanding their production in ammonia and urea. Why are they not expanding in Trinidad and Tobago? I pose another question to the minister. Did the minister make any attempt to seek dialogue with Metanex to encourage them to expand their operations in Trinidad and Tobago? And I also want to ask him while I'm on this subject. How much time and money did the government waste on the SADC fictional mega project, which was so loudly trumpeted in the recent budget? Not this one, the ones before. He also struggled to explain the reason why AUM2, the construction of which was supposed to start on January 2011 and was meant to be the flagship of the People's Partnership Administration in Energy, which has not materialized. I continue to hold the view that this project, with gas contracts and financing arrangements already in place, is still very much in limbo because of decisions taken or not taken by the PP administration. The minister should however pose to investors in that project the question, why are they expanding their operations and investments in Mexico, the United States, and Mozambique, and not in Trinidad and Tobago? A project which has financing in place, gas contracts in place, no action in Trinidad and Tobago. Government gone silent after three budgetary, um, exp uh, three budgetary announcements that the project is coming imminently. But the investors are expanding in Mozambique, in Mexico, and the United States. But in Trinidad and Tobago, nothing. And I want to make a comment on the vexing aluminum industry. One that the same industry I'm talking about here is the one that Finance Minister Winston Dukeran wrote to Energy Minister Kevin Ramnarine on in 2011, asking him to consider a core industry in the Southwest Peninsula around aluminium. Maybe the minister might want to tell us if he did in fact answer that Dukeran letter 
and what was proposed to him then. But I want to say, I first want to make the point that the lead of the development of this industry in the form of a small smelter of 125 metric tons per year, all of which would have been converted to high quality downstream products, was taken by Votorantim, the largest private sector producer in Brazil, and Sural, the largest independent producer of aluminum wire products. They were here to do that project. The state's role was that of facilitator and eventually a minority shareholder of 20%. That's what we faced when we talked aluminum, which was eventually dealt with in the way it was dealt with. The minister made no reference to the real reasons for the cancellation of this project, but instead has shifted his attention to the post-cancellation activities of the project and provided information which, if he was careful to check, he would have seen was inaccurate. The accurate information is as follows. The then Minister of Finance, Winston Dukram, in his first budget speech in 2010, in one simple statement, indicated that the project was cancelled. No elaboration, no reason given, strictly a straight, naked political decision. Two, no formal communication to the private sector shareholders who had at that point together spent 30 million US in developing the project over a year. So we now understand why they are in arbitration and we look forward to hearing how that is going for and on behalf of the people of Trinidad and Tobago and what our liabilities are there. All we have had so far is silence and those who know in the government not talking. The state-owned Chinese company CNEC also received communication of this cancellation of the project several months after the Dukaran announcement. And of course, the government of Trinidad and Tobago rejected the 400 million US dollar loan from China and sought to take steps to redirect that loan. We don't know what has happened with that so far. But there's, a, there's an interesting post-cancellation story which the minister is silent about. A new board was established for the same council project. The chair of this board, being a recent graduate of law, but whose major qualification was in fact that she's the niece of a cabinet minister. So there we have a board treating with a cancelled project and to the best of my knowledge, still in existence three years after the cancellation. Doing what I am uncertain, but presumably being paid as members of board of directors. I would like the Minister of Energy to clarify that and to tell us what this cancelled project is costing us, if only at the level of the board, and when is the cancellation going to be effective. Again, an interesting post-cancellation result is the fact that some $120 million, Trinidad and Tobago dollars, that is, of highly technical equipment has been sitting in a warehouse, rotting away for the past three years while awaiting a decision of the government on its possible use or disposal. This equipment was geared to introduce a brand new technology of the aluminum industry, unrelated to alitrin, but with the prospect of producing high value aluminum products using proprietary technology. That is rotting away, I think, that's in one of you, or somewhere where it's, where it's being hidden and left to grow grass as other matters in the country. We can now assume that Trinidad and Tobago have lost the opportunity of becoming a leader in the transformation technology of aluminium, not necessarily supplied from the aborted aluminium project. There's one other point I must deal with. The minister made the statement in response to my contribution on the erosion of the country's credibility. He stated without hesitation that the credibility of this country is at its highest ever. Dream on, laugh on. I wish to disagree, and in, indeed, there is evidence 
to show that our credibility is at its lowest internationally and in the boardrooms of the energy companies around the world, Trinidad and Tobago's stature has diminished considerably and our competitiveness, given our gas shortage arrangements at the moment, make us not as attractive as we'd like to be. And add to that the insult of the Prime Minister not seeing the emissary of the President of Ghana on an energy matter that has done nothing for our image as a country serious about energy growth and expansion into new areas and so on. But let me come back to the publications in the newspaper about this Laurent Manetti. And the one I'm really concerned about, in the face of what I just pointed out there, in today's paper, there's the Minister of Energy after his whirlwind tour of the media being quoted in The Guardian today, making two very pronounced statements, and I quote them for you. The 73.06% of the field on the Venezuelan side of the block, to block two, referred to as Loran, is the property of the Venezuelan, of the Venezuelans. And it is their sovereign right to determine how it is to be monetized and where it is to be monetized. He goes on to say, the 26.94% of the field on the trade island side in our block 6D, referred to as Manatee, is the property of Trinidad and Tobago. And it is our sovereign right to determine how it is to be monetized and where it is to be monetized. So these two profound statements by the minister should ask us, how then are the Venezuelans able to talk so confidently about what they are going to do with their gas on their side? And he can tell us nothing. Because you see, this matter came up at this particular time, at the budget discussions, only when the government sought to take credit by telling us that they had arrived at an agreement which will see our gas being monetized in Loran Manity. I took the parliament floor and I expressed optimism that this had been achieved because we are now in a position to extract gas from the gas fields on the border. Because it's something that we've been working on for a number of years. It was stalled because we couldn't get agreement. Now the government has announced that we have got agreement, so we all were happy. But then we ask, what is the agreement? And then we told, it's not really an agreement. This is the minister now responding, saying, it's not really an agreement all we have done is agree to form some committees. Well, that is not what we started out being led to believe. We were led to believe that there were specific agreements about extraction arrangements and we could now proceed. When we raised questions about the nature of the agreement, having seen the agreement, the minister turned around and said, all we have agreed to do is to form three committees. Well, if that was the case, what were you seeking to take credit for? Forming committees? But then the Prime Minister was saying something quite different. That we have in fact had agreement, which meant that we have now concluded negotiations and can proceed. And, of course, in the newspapers, we've been told that the President of Venezuela is due here sometime soon to sign an agreement. Now, if one takes the minister seriously, that all we have done so far is agree to form some committees, what is the president of Venezuela coming here to sign? But then we have the prime minister saying that there's some agreement and some signing can take place. But while our minister is telling us that all we've done is agree to form these committees, the reports are coming out of Venezuela very confident that Venezuela can proceed to do now what Venezuela wanted to do. Not just committees. Let me quote for you a story here which is of interest to us. And this is the one 
coming out of Trinidad after, after the discussions went public. And it says that the Venezuelan president is coming here to pay an official visit to sign an energy cooperation agreement. And it goes on to say, and this is the reporter saying, ask if Venezuela would be sending gas to Trinidad and Tobago. Ramirez, as the Venezuelan minister said, the gas from Loran Manatee will be sent by pipeline to Grand Mariscal de Ayachu project in Sucre, or that's in Venezuela. But added, let's do what is added there. The Loran Manatee, which is, remember the field is called Manatee on one side, Loran on the other side. He's speaking about Loran Manatee, and the gas will be sent to Sucre in Venezuela. But he added, and I quote, we have several fields along the border which could very well, if we are in agreement, convert into LNG at installation in Trinidad and Tobago. What does that mean? What is the Venezuelan minister saying? He is very clear as to what is going to happen with Loran Manatee. And he's adding, well, maybe some gas could be sent from other fields to Trinidad and Tobago. So gas to Trinidad and Tobago is now only being spoken of in the context of from other fields. What are the other fields? Dorado with 0.3 trillion cubic feet, Coquina with 0.7 trillion cubic feet, combined 1 trillion cubic feet. What I'm asking the Minister of Energy in Trinidad and Tobago, is this his position? Clarify this for us. Here's the Venezuelan minister pointing us to gas from other fields while speaking confidently about Loran Manatee's gas going to Sucre. And there's been no statement from our minister or the Venezuelans about any Loran Manatee gas coming to Trinidad and Tobago. Excuse us here in the PNM if we don't understand what is happening to us and what has happened to us and what the agreement is. We seek clarification, and knowing this government, we think we have, we demand information that we can understand and digest. Now, we go to the report coming out of Britain. And this is against all that was said in API and Reuters when the minister said, when he was asked to explain what Reuters was reporting and what API was reporting from a press conference where he was present in Venezuela. He said it was something that they put on the internet themselves and they were talking to themselves about themselves and it doesn't relate to anything, any agreement. Absolute nonsense. API and Reuters reported the proceedings of a press conference in Venezuela where our energy minister was present and sanctioned what was said by the Venezuelan minister and carried by the international media. Let me quote for you what the London energy experts are being told coming out of Venezuela. And this is the public information arising out of that press conference and the so-called agreement that exists and doesn't exist in Trinidad. And let me read for you. The headline is, and this, this, this is coming out of the UK, uh, a, a reporter, Chris Noon, reporting on the Venezuelan developments. Headline, Caribbean compromise brings hope in Caracas. Not hope in Trinidad and Tobago, brings hope in Caracas. Venezuela signed a deal with Trinidad and Tobago on Wednesday to jointly produce gas from three highly prospective offshore fields spanning the maritime border between, between the two countries in the Caribbean Sea. Bear in mind, I told you there are three fields. We had our expectations pegged on Loran Manatee. We heard the Venezuelan minister pointing us to Dorado and Coquino, right? The other fields. The report in London to all the ex energy experts in London and all the business experts in London and the energy interests in London saying that an agreement has been signed with Trinidad and Tobago on these three fields. The news, and I, I'm quoting the article again, the news is a boon for Caracas with initial production from the largest field, the Loran Manatee Prospect, 
which holds 10.25 trillion cubic feet of resources, to be piped to and sold in Venezuela. No reference to any of it being piped to and used in Trinidad and Tobago. The Latin American country will connect the new supply to another flagship project, raising the prospect of future piped and LNG exports. That's for Venezuela. Venezuelan oil minister Rafael Ramirez, who is also president of state-run PDVSA, as a Venezuelan oil company, signed a deal with Trinidad Energy Minister Kevin Ramnarine in Caracas. And of course, they're quoting our minister with his profound observation. On a clear day, I can see Venezuela from my office. So, you are very close to us physically and as friends, said Trinidad Energy Minister Kevin Ramnarine in comments broadcast over PDVSA radio station. That is the only comment about Trinidad and Tobago from our minister that he could see Venezuela from his office. While serious developments are being commented upon about the use of this gas, the prospect and where it's located and where it's going to go and what it means for Venezuela. No reference to Trinidad and Tobago's involvement in that extraction. Pena Vesa and the United States Major Chevron will begin work on the field immediately and the gas will be commercialized within two years, said Ramirez. Venezuela plans to build a 276 kilometer pipeline from Luran Manatee to Guiria on the country's east coast. So here we are in Trinidad and Tobago. We need our reserves bolstered immediately. No comment on that. Nothing about what we're doing or getting out of it. But the reports are that Venezuela is proceeding immediately to get their business going from this field. Where is Trinidad and Tobago in this? How does it contribute to our uh, to easing our, our, our anxieties? Are we to expect supplies? And if so, in what time frame? No answers, no comment, no, con no conversation. But we know what is happening with the Venezuelans and what they're doing about it. And of course, our minister had nothing to tell us about what's happening with us. The article was going to say, this will connect Laurent Manity to the delayed Mariscal Sucre gas project in the region allowing Venezuela to become a gas exporter to neighboring Colombia by July 2014, said Ramirez. It also raises the possibility of liquefaction trains for LNG exports when production flows increase from both Laurent Manatee and Marisal Sucre. The, uh, excuse, the minister is quoting. The minister is quoting here. This no, this is somebody else, Carlos Berlion, a senior petroleum analyst at IHS at Interfax. Again, out there in the international energy world. This is very good news for Venezuela and Trinidad and Tobago. Now the big question is how fast and economically PDVSA and Chevron can develop the reserves of Laurent Manatee. Bear in mind that whatever benefit we will get from Laurent Manatee being exploited, whether it comes in cash, whatever, whatever, is not the solution to the problem we're trying to face. Unless we get gas to come into our gas industries, some cash from exploiting Loran Manatee in Venezuela does not treat with our problem. And that is what the minister seems to be missing. Until we hear that gas is going to be coming to our industry in Trinidad, the state and the unease about our industry's future will remain. Telling us that it's good business for us that Venezuela is going to exploit immediately and we'll get something from that is not in any way treating with the problem of the longevity and the prospects of attracting in Trinidad industries or retaining our in industries in Trinidad because we have a gas supply problem which the government is ignoring. And that is what the people of this country need to understand and not be misled by government spokespersons who have made a career of misleading this country. The, there's something here which the experts in London point out. The decision to monetize the gas in Venezuela is a sign long-term gas export ambition. Let me repeat that. The decision to monetize the gas in Venezuela 
is a sign that long-term gas export ambitions could be prevailing over short-term profit in Caracas. Selling the gas to Trinidad would have been cheaper in overall project terms because Loran Manatee is closer to the Caribbean island nation which has a superior pipeline and liquefaction infrastructure. And that was the basis on which we were holding out this hope over the years that we could access that gas and bring it to Trinidad and Tobago. The government must tell us now whether the discussions and the agreement have put paid to that any aspirations you might have had in accessing Venezuelan gas. And more importantly, what is the, pros the prospect of accessing our own portion of that gas and having it utilized as part of our reserves here in Trinidad and Tobago? These are the issues that we want dealt with by the minister and the government must come clean, come straight and tell us what has happened, what is going to happen, what is likely to happen and how they are treating with this matter of the gas supply for Trinidad and Tobago in the context of what we were expecting and what the outturn has been. The minister's statements in today's papers are not to be taken seriously. I wouldn't even repeat them because they do not address the issue in front of us. And for those who don't understand the implications of what this means, we are not going to wait until the well runs dry to understand how important the water is to us. We have a problem with our gas supply and it needs to be addressed in a way that we can understand where we're going and a minister who is prepared to play games while describing himself as not being an expert, he is not required to be an expert. He is required to get expert advice and to make the best decisions for the people of Trinidad and Tobago. As it stands now, I would be very happy if somebody outside of the minister's immediate circles tell the country that we understand exactly the answers to the questions I've raised this morning. There are a number of questions here which require to be addressed by the Minister of Energy. And unless those questions are answered, the people of Trinidad and Tobago will be in the dark and we have no idea where our future is going in terms of a sustainable uh, gas industry, a gas pricing arrangements, our competitive arrangements, attracting new industry, all we know. We've attracted none. This government has presented four budgets, every single one, pointing to industries coming. Not one has it materialized. We've, we're out there um, doing some exploration. We hope that we'll be successful. That's one side of it. But it's in deep water. And therefore, we have pricing issues. Our contracts are coming to an end at Point Lisas. One of the more thorny issues there is the pricing arrangements for new gas going into old industry. And more importantly, there are questions on the table that the government is not holding up to with respect to our partners in energy questioning the role of the NGC as a middleman in the industry. These are matters of serious concern to the people of Trinidad and Tobago and should form part of our serious discussions. They are not, and we are relying on incompetent misleaders who will take us down the road of no return if we're not careful. Any questions? So nothing the minister said at all in any of his um, responses to your concerns? Nothing addressed it? Nothing addressed The Minister of Energy is not addressing the issues which are paramount and which require attention and require candor with the people of Trinidad and Tobago. What, as I said, this whole thing started out with the government trying to take credit for something. And when we ask what that something is and you examine it, you realize that there are more questions than answers. Right now we are seeking answers. And the answers given by the government do not indicate that we have dealt with the problems that we are facing. For many years, you've been holding out hope that Loran Manatee could come to the rescue of Point Lisas and could generate interest. Because we see when you enter contracts with these um, foreign direct investors in energy, they are long-term contracts. You have to have a solid reserve base, 25 years. That has, it has nothing to do with government is in office. It has to do with whether there's the resources there for a long period of time. What we have now 
those contracts are ending and new contracts will be of a similar nature if we, if we get them renewed. And therefore your reserves for the long term is important to position you and to present you as being able to attract new industry. Otherwise, you'll just be talking around like the minister without solving any problem. And when we hear that there is an agreement to, to, to extract Laurent Manatee, we genuinely expected that there would have been something in this agreement that points to gas coming to Trinidad. That has not happened. And the government must tell us what has... Okay, the, gov the government of Venezuela is talking about how they're going to proceed in Venezuela. How do we stand to benefit from that? And if, it's only, if it only applies to the Venezuelan portion of the gas, what is the story about the Trinidad portion of the gas? These are simple, straightforward questions. For which there are no answers. Dr. Rowling, you mentioned that um, the, some contracts are, are coming to an end. Can you, can you uh, enlighten us on some specifics? Well, there are a number of, of, of gas contracts at Point Leases and, and um, some of the companies down there, um, which are either close to coming, to, uh, they're running out of their lifespan. And in that case, you need to renegotiate new contracts if you will continue. Uh, I'm, I'm not in a position this morning to give you the specific details, but I do know that there are a number of significant contracts there which are approaching the end of their life. What are some of the, the far-reaching uh, Im implications of Point Lisa not having the natural resources that it needs to, to to continue to refine? Well, when you look at the contribution that the Point Lisa industries and Atlantic LNG make to the national budget, you would know if those inflows are not there then the service of Trinidad and Tobago and the quality of life that we enjoy today would be severely impacted. We also have, we are also building up significant debt as we continue to service ourselves at the current levels. That debt has to be paid for by revenues anticipated to come from these areas. So if there's any hiccup, I'm not just talking about next year or the year after, there has to be a, a, a steady revenue flow coming in to pay that debt. So these are the considerations. And what is worrisome is that the people making the decisions now about Point Lisas are making those decisions against a background of gas being available in our market areas at more competitive prices. And those people are expecting or pressuring the Trinidad and Tobago government or, or, or agencies for better arrangements in the gas pricing. And against that background, the only new gas we are expecting is expensive gas from deep water. Can't you see the complication there? If we get new gas, it's going to be deep water gas. Expected to be expensive. Our industries are expecting new contracts on better terms. Those terms, if they are to be supplied by new gas, are being expected from new gas of high price. But they're expecting improved terms. And that is what the government is not dealing with. They're just kicking this can down the road. So I prefer to hear the Energy Minister of Trinidad and Tobago address these issues than try to describe the, the opposition and other commentators in any philosophical uh, conclusions he has come to. That's not his job. His job is to treat with the problem. We, we have a problem. And the problem is not being engaged by the government. And our fear is that the government could drag its feet and not confront this issue until it becomes too, too much of a problem to be dealt with in short term, and that's the worst way to negotiate. If you're negotiating against short term deadlines, and it is not unknown of this government to be irresponsible in the energy sector. This is a government that took almost a year to appoint boards in the energy sector, costing us tremendous loss of opportunity. This is a government that appointed huge numbers of incompetent, unqualified people to hold down significant positions. So it is not far-fetched to expect that this irresponsibility on the part of the government of not facing up to the problem that we have, either because they're too incompetent or they're just cynical. They see themselves as trying to hold on until the next election and then it's somebody else's problem. That is what this country is facing. Thank you very much.